700 WLW in Cincinnati. That's the tower you're looking at from top to bottom. It's actually two towers uh, riveted together at the center. So the bottom half of that tower is actually another tower upside down. Hi, it's Art Vola for Tom Connor and the Air Jack Factory. We're on the premises right now, the highly guarded, I might add, premises of the WLW transmitter. This is where the world's first and only 500,000 watt transmitter ever was. And this place is like taking a trip through a museum in time. We're gonna go join Randy Michaels, who's in the building right now, and he'll give you a quick tour of one of the greatest transmitter sites of any AM radio station in the United States, right here in Cincinnati, north of. We're in Mason, Ohio, about 30 miles north of the city of Cincinnati. at the big one, 700 WLW. Randy? Welcome to Mason, Ohio in the 700 WLW transmitter. I'm standing in front of the Continental 317C that we use as our main most of the time now. It's the, the monster that normally drives that big tower you just saw out in the yard. And as I understand how this thing works, the object is to make all of these meters go as far to the right as possible. And this is something that you really should see. This is, uh, although it's been extensively modified, the very first 50,000 watt transmitter ever built. As you may know, WLW was not only the first 5,000 watt station, it was the first 50,000 watt station and the first 500,000 watt station. As you can see from the modern modulators uh, here in this section, it's been extensively modified, but this baby is uh, 60 some years old and it still works. Here's the driver section. And uh, this tube, by the way, was designed for 250 kilowatts. It loafs along at 50. Uh, this was uh, built in the 30s. We just had a, a couple of these rebuilt, and uh, as you can see, it still works. We have this on the air quite frequently. This transmitter, uh, with, a, with its power supply, will do uh, well over 100,000 watts. Believe me, that's still no strain for that big antenna out there. This is the antenna tuning unit for uh, the uh, Western Electric 1927 transmitter that you just saw. That's uh, the original stuff, and it still works. It's another very famous transmitter. This is the famous Rockwell Cathanode. Although it wasn't terribly efficient, this operates flat from 20,000 cycles down to 20 cycles with less than a quarter dB variation and less than three-tenths of 1% distortion. Highest fidelity transmitter ever built, and it, too, still operates here at the big one. Part, these old transmitters are so big you can walk inside. This is, uh, I'm inside the modulation section now of that 1927 Western Electric. And by the way, most of this transmitter isn't even on this floor. Most of it is down in the basement, and in just a minute I'll show it to you. It's absolutely huge. All right, we're down inside the power supply for the Western Electric 50 kilowatt. Those glass rods that you see uh, carry water up to cool that big 250 kilowatt tube. We keep the water on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all those tubes provide decoupling between the uh, output tube and the power supply. You can see the uh, modulation chokes and the uh, power transformers and so forth are right behind me. And uh, as I said, the power that comes out of this room is enough to drive that transmitter, let's just say, well over 100,000 watts. Art, this is the power supply for the Rockwell Cathanode High Fidelity Transmitter that we saw upstairs. We're down in the basement, 700 WLW, and uh, something that's kind of interesting, everything you see in this room was home-built, handmade, right here in the building out of uh, war surplus parts right after World War II. This was all war surplus junk. Now it's the world's highest fidelity transmitter. All right, while we're down in the basement, I thought I'd show you a little bit uh, down here some of the stuff from the 500,000-watt transmitter. You know, WLW is the only American station ever authorized for half a million watts. Ran a half a million from 33 to 39, and again overnight during the war. And it's been a long time since it's been on, but what do you think? We have our own power substation out in the front yard. 33,000 volts comes in from Cincinnati. There's a backup service in 33,000 volts from Dayton, but we really don't need them. We have this generator and enough fuel in the ground to run for over a month with no power from anyone. Well, Art, come on in. Uh, I know you'll want to see this. In the uh, about late 50s, early 60s, someone decided that WLW ought to have a bomb shelter, and here it is. We can uh, control the transmitter from down here, play records. We have uh, the latest state-of-the-art monitoring devices right here. And uh, as you can see, we have medical supplies, water, and ooh, how about we open these up for a snack? Yum, yum. All these comforts, I have no idea why I pay for a condominium. Art, you can make fun of this tuner, but it works. See it driving this Crosley limiter? They made these and sold them to a lot of stations. WCCO has one uh, that still works. You know, you got to admit, WLW, it's uh, some kind of radio.
I can't believe you made me do that. All right, this is uh, going to be kind of hard to get in one picture. Largest commercial transmitter ever built. Operated here from 1933 through 39. It's a half a million watts, and uh, actually that's not true. It's a 750 kilowatt transmitter. It loafed along at a half a million, and it's been pushed to well over a million several times. These are the three 250 kilowatt output sections. And there's a modulator and power supply way down there. If you want to sneak around the back, I'll show you some of the uh, innards to this thing. All right, come on around here. This is going to look like, uh, gee, uh, something out of a mad scientist movie. And these big coils and those things that look like bread trays were the uh, output tuning for each of the 250 kilowatt sections. The, uh, the bread trays are capacitors, and these are the output tuning coils right here. If you can take a shot of this. Or just like this, as I said, each one could comfortably 200, do 250,000 watts. So at uh, half a million watts, why, this thing just loafed along. This is uh, the only part of our big beast that's missing. Uh, this used to be the modulator for the uh, 500,000 watt transmitter. When the, the Cubans gave us trouble in the early 60s, the government contemplated moving this entire operation to Cuba, and they purchased and moved uh, the modulator section and then abandoned this project and built the station that's on Marathon Key now. So this is the only transmitter we have that no longer operates. The government won't let us use it, and we're not, we're not the kind of people who would sneak it on in the middle of the night. Well, we're really not. Well, I don't want you to think we are. So it's now just the world's most interesting record rack. <laughs> you may wonder how we maintain all this old stuff. We have enough parts out here to build three or four more. These things haven't been made for 40 or 50 years, but uh, we got a lot of them, capacitors. And here, you need a meter? How about one of these? All right, I've uh, been out here hundreds of times now, and every time I come out, I find something new. Here's some logs from WLW when it was a half a million watts. This one's from February 9th, 1935, and Moon River got on the air okay that day. We're looking at the cooling pond that was used to cool uh, all the tubes in the 500,000-watt transmitter as late as the uh, early 1960s when WLW was petitioning to be allowed to use 750,000 watts again. They ran 750,000 watts, burned off 700,000 of it right there in that pond, and radiated only 50 to prove that the techno technology was still here to do it, and that water would boil in the wintertime with, with all the heat. Here's the power substation. Uh, you can see uh, one of the feed lines coming in there. And then we have cables from there into the building to supply all the power for this place. This house was the WSAI transmitter when uh, SAI was owned by Crosley along with WLW. Now it's the residence of our chief engineer, Jim Hampton. He lives right here at the site. During World War II, this big transmitter was considered a national defense item. So this place was patrolled by guards. And there were also guards stationed up there with machine guns in that gun tower. Uh, we don't have guards anymore. We just use it now as uh, sort of a, an unusual uh, STL receive tower. <laughs> said that one of the reasons that they had guards up there in that tower is that uh, during the war they uh, used frequency shift keying, coded information to send uh, information to Europe on 700 about troop movements and so forth. That's one of the reasons they considered this uh, so important to the national defense. It was an airplane beacon. It was taken out of service in the 60s after the second airplane hit this tower. Uh, one theory was that uh, they had this confused with a, with a runway. Another was that someone was using WLW on their automatic direction finder, and the direction finder worked a little too well. If you look real carefully up about the 700-foot level, you can see some bent cross members where a plane lost in its fight with the big Blahnox Tower. We're inside the antenna tuning unit at the base of the tower. As you can see, the uh, shunt capacitor here was designed for half a million watts. And uh, of course, you can't see this on video, but the metal in here, even though it's cold outside, is very warm. And can you hear this talking? Can you hear that uh, talking? The, uh, the parts in here just vibrate with the modulation. Must have been really loud at half a million watts, huh? Uh, gee, I'm getting shocked on the microphone here as we are trying to show you the base of uh, this big 831-foot uh, tower here in Mason. F over 400 tons is sitting on that insulator, and it was designed to eventually take powers up to 5 million watts. Hope these pictures come out. If they don't, it's because we're getting an awful lot of RF. The uh, microphone cable, as a matter of fact, has shocked uh, me and shocked Art just a minute ago as we tried to plug it into the camera. 
Randy, thank yes. you for the tour. You're I can't, extremely welcome. That was a, that was what you call your basic 10-minute tour of the big one here. 50,000 watt WLW. This has always been one of my favorite radio stations. Now you know why we call it the world's loudest watts. You better believe well, that's, that's what it stands for, <laughs> according to this guy, anyway. And uh, let's see, we saw you last on Video Air Checks number 7, I think, with Alan Gardner doing Midday. Yes, uh, but I've reformed. I, I don't do that anymore. Now you're what? You're, you're like... Uh, head of the whole company now I've, or something? Uh, we've hired Alan first to program uh, 700 WLW so someone competent would be in charge and I don't do anything anymore. <laughs> Skip well, tours. Well, fantastic. I want to thank you very much for being here, giving us a tour of the... Uh, you know, by the way, for those of you that are listening closely to the sound and hearing a little distortion, a little little noise in the background, it's not really noise, it's WLW radio, it's getting in all the equipment. Here. We could turn it down to 45,000 watts or something <laughs> if you think that might help. It's getting into the video equipment here and everything. I think I'm picking it up on my bones inside. Well, now you know why we say 700 WLW stands for the world's loudest watts. <laughs> world's loudest watts. I'll, I'll buy that sure. at Treasure Island. All right. Thank you very much. This is your tour from the tower out all the way from the bottom to the top at the big one, 700 WLW. WLW. Thank you, Randy Michaels, for that tour of the big one, WLW. Don't you find it fascinating that one of the shortest guys in broadcasting works at the big one? I do.